Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da habita fillah Continue on in the book of marriage We have reached the 863rd hadith And this is still in the chapter, the first chapter of Kitab al the chapter of equality in marriage and right of choice. And we reach the hadith of uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala narrated Ibn Abbas <coughs> narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala a woman had accepted Islam and then remarried. So her previous husband came and said O Allah's Messenger, I had accepted Islam and she knew that I had done so. So Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam took her away from her second husband and returned her to her first one. Reported by Ahmed, Abu Dawood, and Ibn Majah. Ibn Hiban and Al-Hakam graded it as authentic or sahih. In this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in general from this hadith the meaning is that if uh, a person is separated due to kifa'a, due to, as we mentioned, the equality, uh, one of the traits of that distinguishes uh, people, such as um, differences in religion. That if someone separates due to difference of religion, and during the idda, the man also accepts Islam. And this is as we spoke about earlier. And the woman comes to know, then she cannot marry another person. If she marries unknowingly, her marriage will be canceled, but her, ha her having had sexual relations during this period will not be punishable according to the Sharia, because there's some doubt in this um, issue. So this means, as in this hadith, uh, that a woman, she had accepted Islam and then she remarried, but she remarried uh, during the time of her idda, And this shows the importance of the idda of observing the time period, the hayd, uh, the, the um, menstruation cycles, the three menstruation cycles, for the uh, Idda and that when we compromise that Idda then you see the problems that result from that and as ha uh, we mentioned prior to this that often we don't uh, you know in the amongst Christians and Jews nowadays because perhaps this Idda was practiced by the Christians and Jews and perhaps the even the pagans during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but now these the Idda is only practiced uh, with Muslims Muslims practice the Idda so therefore we find that if in in such a scenario but uh, but if the woman is actually in her Idda and she is the one who becomes Muslim then there's there's no problem this will be easily easy to determine but if the situation is reversed and it's her husband the man becomes uh, Muslim and then she is in uh, she doesn't observe it because she is a Christian then this is where you can find uh, difficulty so in this hadith however the uh, woman had accepted Islam and then remarried so she had become the Muslim, and her husband was remained as a uh, whatever religion he was on their previous religion. And then the the previous the first husband, her husband, uh, who was still 
uh, a disbeliever, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he, he was a Muslim. And this was during her idda. And then he informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he, you know, wanted his wife back and that she was basically, she was on her idda. It was the time of her idda. She did not observe the idda, you know. She was still during her idda and she married a Muslim man. But, however, she did know her husband. Uh, she Maybe she waited for a, a short period of time and found out her husband was Muslim, but she married someone else, um, a Muslim man. But both of them were Muslim at that point because the man said, I had accepted Islam and she knew that I had done so. So for this reason, so Allah's Messenger وسلم, took her away from her second husband. So the new marriage, the new marriage was nullified and returned her to her first one. And this is an authentic hadith. So from this hadith, there are immense benefits. And one of those uh, benefits is that, of course, that the idda should be observed. And this hadith relates to the other uh, hadith uh, that we mention. And so here, in this uh, scenario, the woman was actually still in the nikah or the marriage of her original husband. This is the reason the Prophet ﷺ took her away from the new husband and brought her back to her original husband because she was still Islamically married to him. She was still Islamically married to him. So this was a hukum shari. So due to this fact of still being married to him, then of course a woman cannot have two husbands. Even if she had chosen, and maybe she was unaware of this. I don't think she did this out of spite or something, but she may, maybe just did not want to be with her, her, uh, her prior spouse, or she found someone and he was Muslim, and then she, she liked him and she wanted to marry, and then she found out her, her ex-husband, who or she, the one she was still in Idda, her original husband, then became Muslim. So the ruling was, is that he, she still remained in that marriage. So that's why, of course, uh, a woman cannot have two husbands, and you cannot just walk off and get married like that. So this is uh, was the situation here, and that's why the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam returned her to her uh, her first husband. From this hadith. One of the benefits is that it illustrates for us this Sharia ruling that, of course, if a woman is still married, that she cannot uh, marry someone else. Okay? Uh, this seems like common sense when there is a, a marriage, but where it becomes doubtful, especially people who don't have uh, uh, a lot of Islamic knowledge or are new to Islam that when these scenarios come up, not knowing about the idda, you know, not knowing about the, the waiting period and, and how long the waiting period is and the, and the situation of gen, generally not observing the waiting period when you were, you were, uh, you know, in, from your prior faith, if you were a Christian or a Jew or whatever, that you didn't, you didn't practice in idda. So you're not aware of of this waiting period that Islam observes. So, say if a woman was a Christian, and then she becomes a Muslim, and her prior spouse uh, is not a Muslim, she may not realize that she should be observing the waiting period. And due to this problem, then she just ups and marries uh, a Muslim man. So this is this is a very common. A scenario especially that we have is reverts that can easily occur because a lot of us are unaware of this ruling that a woman would have to even have a waiting period uh, even as she's coming into Islam that she would have a waiting period from her prior spouse maybe she's coming to Islam and she wants to leave everything behind her she was having problems with her husband and now she finds out that she can't be married to a pagan or a Jew or a Christian man and she is 
becoming stronger in her faith and it's in the you know still early stages of her Islam a month or two months in and she wants to remarry she decides she wants to remarry a new uh, a new husband so she may not be aware of this waiting period in this scenario so this is why uh, this is how a scenario like this happens and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best uh, that this was probably the case of this this woman who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in the second uh, uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that if a man marries a woman and there is doubtfulness in the nikah okay but he believes that it is sound he believes that the marriage is sound and in fact it is um, you know an illegal marriage then there is no uh, punishment or no sin upon those individuals because they operated they thought it was sound they didn't know the ruling and there there was some doubtfulness in the act but they didn't know and this is why it's very important also because sometimes also this happens especially in in the West um, that sometimes there is sh uh, doubtfulness in the nikah that we don't know was a woman did she even finish a idda especially if she's a new muslima and she's not really aware uh she perhaps was married and divorced in very in a very short period of time it's very quick and then she is unaware uh of her idda or that she has an idda meaning the waiting period or what have you so then this is where there can become doubtfulness in the nikah and in fact she can be in her waiting period and already getting married and already consummating the marriage so these are very important issues to have uh, to be grounded in and have an understanding about because you can see the mufasid or the harm that results from these issues of not uh, you know being separated because your marriage was really not valid or harming the other party that was your marriage was not invalidated or had not finished you were really married to your old your ex-husband you were still in idda and then you violated the idda so these all of these things they can cause disharmony between the muslims and they can cause sin and and problems especially if the woman then gets pregnant if she gets pregnant in the new marriage but her marriage is really not legitimate so there's all kind of difficulties that can arise from these types of scenarios. In the next hadith narrated Zayd bin Kaab ibn Ujra radiallahu ta'ala on his father's authority Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam on his father's authority Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married al-aliyah of Banu Ghaffar uh, when she had entered in his presence and removed her clothes he saw whiteness of leprosy around her waist area and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said put on your clothes and return to your family he ordered her dowry to be given to her, reported by Al-Hakam in its chain of narrators, is Jamil bin Zaid, who is Majhul, who is an uh, unknown or unaccredited narrator. There is also a great difference of opinion as to who was his sheikh. In the meaning of this hadith, and the hadith has, uh, you know, an authentic applicability, uh, this hadith, and this is why this hadith is also in this chapter, the chapter of uh, equality in marriage and the right of choice, the right of khayar. And the reason being is that uh, when the Prophet wasallam married Al-Aliyah of, of Banu Ghaffar, radiallahu ta'ala anha, 
that the Prophet ﷺ could have chosen to keep her with her uh, deficiencies or her, her illness that she had, her illness of the skin. And so that's why it's under this chapter of khayar, of, of a choice, that there is the choice, of course, to remain, remain in the marriage. However, the Prophet ﷺ uh, chose to separate from her because there was, there was deception in the marital contract. You know, she, her, this, um, which is known as an aib in, uh, in Arabic, this uh, shortcoming or this illness was not made known from the get-go. So this is very important, and this goes back to the ahadith in which we were studying prior to this chapter about the importance of seeing the uh, the suitor that the, the 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 that both the parties see each other. In fact, but especially that the man sees the woman that he gets a a, a good enough look that's satisfactorily that is satisfactory uh, that is uh, satisfying as far as not going beyond the bounds as we mentioned uh, just to uh, enjoy himself but rather instead it should be in order for him to determine and see uh, prior to marriage what uh, enough of the characteristics of the woman he's going to spend his life with that he's going to be married to so that's why it's very important to get that look. Likewise, as with biur, as with buying and selling, likewise in marriage, the marriage contract equally as much that deception is something which can nullify the contract. That there is no deception. Deception is unacceptable in Islam. So deceiving uh, by not letting someone know because there's a, and, and we'll get to that in some other uh, ahadith, uh, that this uh, is one of the ways that can be a means for uh, uh, nullifying the marriage, that the marriage will be uh, nullified or negated. So in this hadith, there are many benefits of this hadith. And... From the benefits, so we see that the woman, she had, as they mentioned, either a leprosy or she had what we know in time, uh, in contemporary times, one of the other ailments that it could have been was vitiligo. And due to this ailment and it not being known, then, uh, then this was considered a type of deception as if she was going to... Uh, hide this or sometimes there may be a description that for example a, a, a suitor may want to marry and especially in this contemporary time now with the internet and so forth a lot of times people give deceptive pictures have deceptive profiles on the on internet sites or whatever the case may be it's very difficult to actually determine and to de have an accurate description of what someone looks like without actually seeing them and having a, a good enough look to know what the person looks like. So this can be deceiving for, uh, for the parties. And when this is the case, that there's deception, then this can be a cause for nullifying the nikah, for uh, invalidating the nikah due to this deception. So in this uh, case scenario, the Prophet ﷺ was not made known uh, that this woman had this uh, this ailment or this deficiency. And, and as, I, as I was getting to, that also sometimes the degree of an ailment, so maybe someone says, you know, sometimes I have a little cough, okay? But then it, it comes to find out when you marry the person that they have a severe form of asthma or an asthma attacks. You should be made aware of this because this person now you're going to enter into marriage with someone who is sickly, and you should be. This should be made known prior to that. And if it's not, and there's a type of deception, then you can uh, break that marriage before consummating or, or or what have you. So that way there is no greater harm caused to both parties. And we'll talk about some of those more in depth issues related to that. 
one of the benefits of this hadith is that first uh, one of the benefits of this hadith is that um, of course that the husband and wife can uh, be naked in front of one another that this this hadith is an illustration for us that this is permissible because uh, al Aliya she was getting uh, she was undressing herself in front of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So this lets us know the permissibility of this, that it's per perfectly permissible for the husband and wife to see each other because th that is the one person that's lawful for you, especially as, a, you know, for the, for the wife seeing the husband, but likewise vice versa. That is a person who's lawful for you, and she's covering herself when she goes outside. You know, as a, fulfilling that sacred duty to her Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, not being a fitna in the society. So the fact that she's covering up, this is the place where she can uncover and they can enjoy one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-kareem, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِذُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ إِزْوَاجِهِمْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mu'minun, verse 5 through 6 that those talking about the characteristics of the believers and those whom uh, who preserve their private parts you know they protect their private parts except from their spouses except from their wives okay so letting us know that this is the permissible permissible time to enjoy yourself to uh, to be able to to see one another and enjoy one another uh, and fulfill your sexual desire because this is uh, this is innate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with these with these desires. So this is the halal means for doing so. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us that if there was some deception and that you know when a that there's no problem that they can uh, separate so as we, we and we mentioned a few scenarios and in, in the hadith is mentioned that she had either vitiligo or she had leprosy which is very serious uh, you know some thing that was unappealing to the Prophet so the fact that it was a type of deception and he was not made aware of this prior to marriage then he has the choice and there's no problem with him uh, separating from her. However, if he's made fully aware that this is this is different, then there's no deception there. Then that would be uh, uh, a type of oppression. Allah uh, Also, uh, there's also some things to consider from the benefits of the hadith that if they separate, that of course, there's a couple of issues that arise there. One of the issues is that this is a test and a trial for the woman. And we know real scenarios like that where women have described themselves and to a suitor, and then, especially because this was done, these, these particular incidences were done uh, through distance, through either pictures, through the internet and then when the suitor brings the woman and he finds that the severity of her illness similar to this scenario I, I know a scenario that happened similar to this and this uh, shows uh, you know that the that the hadith is is very relevant and that this uh, that it's relevant in that these these things occur and so the harms that are, uh, also result are also something to consider. That this woman now has physically shown herself. For one, she, if she normally covers, and then now she has even undressed in front of someone, and then he rejected her, then this can be difficult on her heart. This can be painful from the rejection, from the point of rejection. Number two, also, the fact that someone has seen her and seen her her deficiencies so those are two ways that 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 can be harmful to her 
the third way in which it can also be harmful, and this is why we should also consider this and consider these as serious matters and benefit from this hadith, is the third way is that it can, uh, that she is now separated from, she was just recent, she was happy, and then instantly from the happiness she becomes sad because there was no accurate portrayal of her deficiencies, or likewise, it could be the case of the husband. Similarly, that he could not have described certain things that he has, ailments, what have you, and then this becomes clear, then likewise, the same, uh, the same scenario and the harmfulness and the hurt can happen. So that happiness that she was going to experience or he was going to experience uh, because then all of a sudden they the because of the deception the marriage is annulled or or what have you then this also can be in a uh, something which is difficult to accept and this is why it requires a lot of patience and uh, and, and that it, this is a sifat of the mu'minin a, a characteristic of the believers is that they're patient during these trials and these tests because this can be a trial and a test and it shows us the seriousness that we have to be aware of these scenarios and have a good idea about who we're marrying uh, and be and, and par all parties being truthful. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us uh, again as we mentioned in prior hadiths using the Kinaya or like the uh, maybe a metaphor metaphorical terms to describe something. So here the Prophet Sallallahu said uh, Al Haki bi ahlika that you know basically uh, you know return to your family or you know or be with your family more or less. And so he didn't say you're divorced or you know you're not I, I don't accept you or something like this which would have been very abrasive and abrupt but however the Prophet Sallallahu considered her feelings and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he did the best to make the blow uh, softer for her the, the, the difficulty of being separated and being rejected he made it softer by saying you know go to your family and uh, and you will and you you receive your mahar. You'll see your 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 um, your dowry. One of the last important uh, benefits that are derived from this hadith is this hadith also shows us related to this scenario that if there is a this scenario where the marriage is that there is separation because there was uh, due to a uh, some illness or as as we mentioned there was some aib you know some deficiency or sickness or what have you uh and there was no the the husband and wife were not alone and he did not they did not have sexual relations then in this scenario there is no mahar in that scenario there is no mahar for her uh, but if he actually has sexual relations with her or even that they were alone then for her is the maha and this is um, uh, a benefit that Ben uh mentioned and those are some of the main benefits of this hadith and there is so much fiqh in this hadith which shows us the fiqh of the son of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Moving on to the 865th hadith narrated Sa'id ibn Musayb Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala and said if any man marries a woman and after sleeping with her finds that she is affected with leprosy or insane she gets her dowry if he divorces her for having uh, intercourse with her. And it is returned to him from the one who has deceived him with regarding her. Sa'id ibn Mansur, Malik, and Ibn, uh, ibn uh, Abi Sheba reported it. Its narrators are thiqa or reliable. Sa'id 
bin Mansur also reported something similar from Ali radiallahu ta'ala and added, and if she has something like a horn mean, uh, coming out of her vagina, Allah, her husband then has the right to divorce her or keep her. And if he had intercourse with her, she gets her dowry for the intercourse her husband has had. In this, uh, these two uh, ahadith or uh, narrations uh, from the Sahabi, radiallahu ta'ala majma'in, starting with the, the one on Umar radiallahu ta'ala in which he said, if a man marries a woman and after sleeping with her finds that she is affected with leprosy or insane, she gets her dowry if he divorces her for having uh, sexual intercourse with her. So this uh, narration is also, of course, in the chapter of Nikah and the chapter uh, about the equality in marriage and right of choice because this is in reference to Ayyub or if there are uh, shortcomings or deformities or something which is displeasing to one of the marital partners then they have the right of course to stay in the marriage or leave the marriage and there's a couple scenarios or a couple ways in which this can happen one of the ways in accordance with this hadith as Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, if any man marries a woman and after sleeping with her finds that she is affected with leprosy or insane, she gets her dowry back if he divorces her after having had sexual intercourse with her. So in this scenario, the man uh, was would be unaware of the aib or the deficiency or deformity or the defect, if you will, of the woman he was marrying. So this could possibly have constituted a type of uh, deception in the marital contract initially. Meaning that the it could be something that the uh, the wali, her guardian, was aware of and she was aware of or in fact the guardian may not know and maybe the woman knows about something that she doesn't feel comfortable sharing and then when the husband consummates he finds out that she has some sort of deformity or deficiency and so this is that scenario so if there was deception then of course then the husband has the right to either uh, continue in the in the marital contract and keep her and you know stay husband and wife and grow together or he has the right or the choice to uh, end the marriage and in the case of having had uh, sexual relations with her she is entitled to the mahar, to her dowry and as Umar radiallahu ta'ala mentioned that in the case in the case uh, in which there was uh, a deception then it would be most just and more just to actually not put the burden upon the man because there was deception. So then that means he, you know, having this desire to have married and then consummating and then finding out that he was deceived, maybe there was some deception that she actually had some mental uh, uh, illness or something like this and that was not made clear from the beginning, then he is now out of the mahar, and sometimes the mahar is very can be a burden uh, upon the men uh, in the marital contract. Some some women they ask for a large uh, mahar, or and sometimes it can be very outlandish and extravagant, and this can be a great burden on the man. So for him to th then lose out on that mahar or the dowry that he has paid and he was deceived in the first place, then this would not be just. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala mentioned that uh, that this dowry would be an unjust burden, so meaning it should be better, it would be better in this situ situation to return the mahar back. And so the general ruling that we see 
that we learn from this hadith is that if there is a deception, then there is the choice, meaning that they have uh, khayar, to either continue in the marriage or they can uh, absolve the marriage and the mahar, if, uh, if there is sexual intercourse, then the mahar, uh, the woman should get the mahar, but due to deception, especially if there was an intentional deception or really, you know, yes, I'm okay, I'm, I'm fine, and then very immediately it becomes apparent she has mental illness or whatever the case may be, or that the family knew or what have you, and there was deception, then from justice, they should return the mahar and not take it. Uh, so this hadith, another benefit of this hadith, this hadith affirms for us what we spoke about from the prior hadith and meanings so it means that if the guardians of a woman by cheating marry a physically deformed permanently sick insane or woman afflicted with leprosy the marriage is canceled due to their fraud similarly if a woman is married by cheating to a defective or abnormal man she has the right to end it uh, if both man and woman agree the marriage is valid so it also lets us and know the hukum this is not just reserved for uh, uh, for 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 men, it's not just to men's advantage, but this is to both parties, and it shows the justice of Islam. That that if a woman finds that there is something that is displeasing to her, that she cannot live with, that's unacceptable, you know, especially if according to custom, then uh, then she has the right to uh, annul the marriage as well. If the husband, for example, has some illness that he did not uh, uh, alert her to prior, and then they had relations, they performed the nikah, she can, in the nikah, have the nikah annulled because she was deceived. Or likewise, if he knows that he is unable to bear children, and she stipulates she wants children, and then he deceives her, and then after relations he says, well, you know, the truth is, this is the scenario, then this would have been, this is a type of deception, so she has the right to either stay in the marriage or uh, annul the marriage. So this works for both parties. If there is some unacceptable uh, illness or there was some deception, then they have the right to nullify uh, the marital contract. And in the case of sexual intercourse, then the mahar goes back, uh, the dowry is returned back to the woman. And if that, that also involved deception, especially intentional deception that was real known, then from justice it would be right to not, uh, to not keep the mahar. In the next hadith narrated Sa'id ibn, Musay, ibn Musayyib, this hadith also, Umar radiallahu ta'ala gave a decree, so this was a fatwa, a fatwa from Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala gave a decree regarding a husband who is impotent, that he must be given delay for one year. Its narrators are reliable. Uh, in this uh, narration, it means that according to the Sharia, an impotent man is he who lacks sufficient strength to... Uh, maintain an erection. Uh, if he inserts it even one time, he will not be regarded impotent. So if he is able to uh, have illustrate potency on on uh, on one occasion, then this is not, according to the Shara, is not regarded as being impotent. Uh, so this is also again a, a deficiency which a, a woman has a right to uh, nullify that because that is also and, and, and according to this fatwa of Umar ibn al-Khattab he said he gave a decree regarding a husband who was impotent that he must be given delay for one year that he should be given time and Umar made a fatwa that it would be uh, one year and so that is just uh, some of the benefits we gain from these narrations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So in general, what we learned 
in this chapter, the uh, chapter of equality in marriage and the right of choice, Bab Kafa'a Wal Khayar, is the importance of Kifa'a, which is equality in marriage, and that the Fuqaha of Islam, that they use some evidences, and some of the evidences were uh, weak and some were stronger. But what we can do, do uh, deduce in general from these ahadith that we study is that uh, that the kifa'a that if uh, that that even with people with people having different status, whether that be financial, whether it be uh, someone being a former slave and someone being free. Uh, tribal differences, differences in wealth, differences in nationality, Arab, non-Arab, or from the different tribes, and so forth, that although Islam recognizes those differences, but in reality, with Allah those differences do not mean much because ultimately it is taqwa, and it is deemed that the kafa'a uh, should be uh, is a, is the most important uh, type of equality that is recognized in Islam, and especially when it comes to being compatible with, for example, one person being very religious and the other person being a fasik, that Islam uh, discourages this, and in fact, as the the scholars mention. And as we've already discussed, that in certain cases that it's impermissible. For example, the zani, the person who is a, an adulterer, to marry a woman who is a virgin and who is a, a righteous woman. Because they're incompatible there. This person is a major sinner and this person is uh, a person who is upright. And so unless they have made toba unless the the one who was uh, was known for adultery has made uh, repentance then their kifa'a uh, they're they're not uh, equal in this sense and they should not be married likewise we also learn from these uh, ahadith the uh, that Islam also allows the khayar the choice in many different situations from according to the ahadith some situations in which uh, people who had embraced Islam that they had uh, marital ties prior to Islam and those customs were not in accordance and in agreement with Islamic law so therefore then they had to make adjustments in order to fit with the Islamic customs and make choices for example, in the hadith, the hadith of, uh, in, in which there was uh, a man who embraced Islam and he had ten wives. So the Prophet wasallam told him, so this was a pre-Islamic custom that they could marry as many women as they wanted. And he had ten. So when he embraced Islam, the Prophet wasallam said, you know, gave him a choice to marry uh, to uh, recognizing his the legitimacy of his marriage but that he would be limited to only four of his wives so he had to make khayar he had to choose and the rest would be divorced and so that shows that the Prophet وسلم, and the Sharia recognized those marriages that were you know uh, that were even according to pagan customs, the customs of Jahiliyyah, because we have no indication that this was a Christian or a Jewish custom. And however, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, recognized that, that, those, that marriage being legitimate in accordance with Islam, and that in embracing Islam, they would have to conform to the Islamic uh, marriage, which only allowed for a man to have four wives. So, this was an illustration of khayar. Likewise, from the hadith, the ahadith 
uh, that illustrated that if there is an aib, if there is a shortcoming and there involves deception in a marital contract, for example, if the wali uh, hides something, or if the woman who is going to be married to her suitor, she hides something. She doesn't mention that she has a mental illness. She doesn't mention, she fails to mention that she has some physical deformities or something. Or uh, likewise, or also, if the man, for example, has some uh, impairments or some physical disability, or he is unable to uh, have children or to, ha to have an erection, that this also affects the marital bond, of course, and with that, the woman is given the right to choose to stay in the marriage or have it nullified because there was deception. If she married, if they both entered in that contract and it was not made known, those uh, ayub or those shortcomings or those uh, deformities or what have you, then this is something which can be cause for nullifying the contract. So this also illustrated uh, as was mentioned in the chapter, uh, khiyar, al khiyar, you know, the right to choice. And that Islam gives us that right, and that uh, in any contracts, whether it be the marital contract or whether it be in the situation of biur, of buying and selling, that all of this impairs the contract and has an effect upon the contract if there is, this is a type of deception and a type of cheating so to speak it's a type of deception in that uh, in the marital situation that the uh, one of the partners deceived the other with regards to their health with regards to uh, other uh, shortcomings or what have you and if it pertained to the uh, to the business contract of course then this would also be a type of or uh, cheating or deception so also cause for uh, nullifying the, uh, the financial contract. So this khayar is in both situations. And those are just some of the many benefits that we gain from those uh, ahadith. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.